Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first lecture over Mills Action Research, the guide for the teacher researcher. So chapter one is all about situating and laying the foundation for action research and how it aligns with larger educational research and traditional educational research. So today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the main points with that, starting with traditional educational research designs that you will see and some how you might incorporate that in your action research, what action research is and the theoretical foundations and some of the reasons why teachers might use this approach to better their practice. So as you can see here, I have in bold here the definition that you will see throughout the book and throughout this lecture today about action research being this systematic inquiry that practitioners take into their own practice for themselves to improve their work and solve problems that they're having on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so when we think about educational research, when we think about the primary goals of educational research that researchers are doing, including action researchers, typically we put the research into several different categories, including to explain, predict, or even try to control variables, predict, with hypotheses. And then sometimes research is intended to understand or describe situations. So when you are thinking about the different research designs, these three on the top are the main ones that you will see in educational research. So quantitative research, qualitative research, and mixed methods research. So in the chapter, Mills goes through each of these and talks about some of the different elements. Um, Mills also introduces you to the idea of positivism, which is the idea that truth can be derived through deduction and through empiricism, that there is a static existing truth that we can come to um, through our research. So that's just one philosophical underpinning. There are others, but within the chapter, he kind of situates it all within those. So when we think about quantitative design and quantitative research, I wanna make sure that you understand quantitative research is separate from quantitative data. So you might know quantitative data is numerical data, and that certainly can be a part of quantitative research, but quantitative research is all about controlling variables and understanding the relationship of one variable on another variable. And so we call that hypothesis testing. So quantitative research can help if it's experimental research and if there's the proper controls, can help researchers identify cause and effect relationships. There's also correlational research and lots of different uh, quantitative designs. But the main thing that you need to know is it is focused on controlling variables. And if you're familiar with the scientific method in terms of independent variable, dependent variable, um, you will understand what that approach is with quantitative research. So having to understand how does one variable impact the other. Now, another type of design is qualitative research. And qualitative research is more so descriptive and seeking to understand phenomenon. And so it uses approaches like narrative and description to really center participants' perspectives and experiences to understand it from their point of view. Um, and I'll go through some examples in a moment. And then mixed methods research makes this synergistic design that incorporates elements from both of those. Now, another thing mentioned in the chapter, so in the chapter, you'll see a really detailed example of mixed methods research, particularly as how you can apply it to action research, and then single subject experimental design, which is also common in action research, so you will see that as well. Now, single subject experimental design is a type of quantitative research. Um, and so again, this is an introduction. We'll continue to talk about this. And as we go through examples, I'll be making connections for you so you can understand where different studies fall in terms of their design, their goals. Okay, so this table is kind of adapted from the table 1-1 in Mills, um, but I did add in a few different elements um, that I like to think of it. So here you can see um, the different goals between quantitative and qualitative. So for quantitative, of course, as I mentioned, understand the relationship between variables, whereas qualitative is to understand and explore a phenomenon in depth. 
Um, so when you think about the design, quantitative is deductive. So you're starting with your hypothesis. You have already planned out your procedure, just like the scientific method, and you follow those to manipulate the variables and then test your hypothesis. Was it correct or not? Whereas qualitative is inductive. So you start with an open-ended research question, and then you collect data and you use that to guide your inquiry. Um, so you're not testing hypotheses or controlling variables in qualitative research. So some examples of qualitative research are strategies called narrative inquiry, where you are doing in-depth interviews with participants and really using narrative to understand their experiences, ethnography, where you are doing observations and over a long time of immersing yourself in a setting, collecting artifacts to really understand uh, what it's like in that situation. And then an example like discourse analysis, analyzing documents, images, um, some so many different designs. And then quantitative, we have like survey research, correlational research, and then uh, like is mentioned in the text, the single subject experimental design and so many other designs. Uh, but those are the main ones as are applicable for our work this semester. Now, in terms of the treatment of data in quantitative research, you will, to carry out your hypothesis testing, you have statistical analyses and inferential statistics to understand if there is a statistical significant difference between what happened with your variables and what would happen if they weren't manipulated. And in qualitative research, the analysis and the treatment of data is descriptive, thematic analysis, coding, and some other approaches there. And then here at the bottom, you can see these underlying beliefs really help you understand why a researcher might choose one design over the other based on the particular research question that they have chosen. So quantitative research is, they both can fall under positivism as Mills discusses in the chapter, but most quantitative research is very firmly rooted within those philosophical underpinnings. So quantitative research assumes that we live in a stable, predictable world that we can measure, understand, and generalize about. And then qualitative research understands meaning to be situated within a particular context and that what happens in one context is not necessarily generalizable to others. Um, and so therefore to, for different people, groups, schools, settings, that there might be a different understanding or context or experience. Um, so those are some of the differences there. And I'm happy to talk more about those. So drop your questions in perusal, anything there that you want me to explain further or give you examples of, I could talk about this for days. Okay, so let's get into action research. So that's the broader, just a very brief lecture over educational research design. Now research design, this is something that you can take course after course after course over. So understand that this is just a very introductory um, description of the design. So if you're still feeling a little confused, that's, um, that's okay because, you know, we're only what, 10 minutes into the lecture, but for this class, this semester, we're really going to be focusing on action research. So action research. So here you can see the key tenets and the principles and the beliefs with action research. So it is systematic. So it's more than just teachers doing a data talk um, that has become quite popular in our schools. So it's systematic. So it's an inquiry that educators do and really other practitioners. It's very common in nursing and the medical fields and in other fields as well. It's conducted by educators to gather information about their teaching practices or it could be about the school, student learning, it could be also collaborative. But the main purpose is to gain insights on improving either the lives of their students, educational outcomes, um, relationships, something about improving their practice for them. So here you can see a bit of a comparison between traditional educational research and action research. So traditional educational researchers that are working in the universities, um, they tend to study topics that are outside of their own practice and really expand on their theoretical understandings of topics. Um, so this is 
a bit cut and dry, but you know, when we think about like in a lab or um, a professor coming to a school and conducting research on the school um, that they're not necessarily a part of. And that's not all of traditional educational research, but um, they tend to in general. And then action research is much different because it is practitioners studying their own practice. So um, of course it's to improve the outcomes for their students and their schools, but it's this kind of self-study for the purpose of taking action. So that's something that is really important with action research, at least in my opinion. So it's more than just becoming the best you can be. It's about engaging in this inquiry so you can take action to make a difference, whether it be on your students, your schools, the family, um, or even larger than that, um, in affecting positive educational change. So that kind of helps you understand the direction that you will be going in as you engage in that throughout the semester. Um, and then there is also collaborative action research where researchers at the university or traditional educational researchers are partnering with teachers who are engaging in action research if they have shared interests or shared goals, or even teachers or practitioners engaging in a project together um, if they have some shared goals there. So in the chapter, Mills introduces his approach to action research. And uh, what I really like about this chapter at the end, Mills goes through several of the most prominent approaches to action research. And so as you are developing your expertise about action research, you can start to hone in on which approach most resonates with you and aligns with your understanding and beliefs about how to best engage in this systematic inquiry of your own practice to better to enact, to take change. Um, but he calls this dialectic action research spiral. Um, and so again, uh, coming back to the same idea done by teachers for themselves. So in these four elements, so first identifying an area of focus. So in this educators, practitioners, teachers are finding, thinking, reflecting on their practice and thinking about an element of their teaching or something that's happening that they want to learn more about and investigate. So that's their area of focus. After they've decided that, they will collect data. This is the systematic part. So first think about the issue or the problem that they want to investigate further. Then think about how to collect data to collect some evidence about what's happening with that. Now within here, I should, I failed to mention. So identify an area of focus. So not only are you identifying an area of focus, you're coming up with a proposed intervention that you want to examine the effectiveness of. And uh, in this chapter two, you'll read lots of examples. So you can see, think about, okay, what is the educator's area of focus? What is the issue they wanted to investigate? And then what is the intervention that they are studying? Then they're collecting data on any relevant data related to that and how it's going. Then they're analyzing and interpreting the data that they collected um, to identify patterns and draw conclusions about the effectiveness of the intervention about what happened. And then based on those data, they will develop an action plan uh, and a strategy to address the issues based on the analysis. And this spiral is continuous. So as you can see in this diagram, the different components are interactive, meaning that they are mutually informative and they can go on here. So you can think about, okay, identify an area of focus leads to collecting data, which might help refine the area of focus, or it might lead to um, analyzing and interpreting data. Sometimes after analyzing and interpreting data, you might find you need to collect more data. Then maybe you collect some more, then you uh, develop an action plan. Maybe you collect data on that action plan, or maybe that action plan leads you to a slightly different or related or next area of focus.
And different authors, different um, scholars of action research. Again, um, Mills mentions those at the end, but they have slightly different approaches to the steps or maybe diagrams. So we'll be looking at some of those and thinking about which visualization of the process most resonates with you. Okay, so the chapter also goes into a bit about the origins of action research and the father of action research and uh, how it came to be. Um, so hopefully you find that a little bit interesting. Um, and one of the, the key points there is about the American um, pragmatism. So John Dewey, who is very influential uh, in educational philosophy. So thinking about um, the Deweyan approach to learning is reflection, and it's this iterative process, and it's ongoing, and we are always engaging in it. So out of that, thinking about action research being this reflective practice that teachers and educators are going through to constantly be learning about their own practice. So another interesting portion of this chapter is thinking about some of those theoretical foundations. So we talked about the kind of under, underpinnings of educational research design, but then also the theoretical foundations. So one that may resonate with a lot of you, I know it certainly resonates with me, is critical action research. So critical action research is sometimes called emancipatory action research, but it is focused on, and it really is reflective of this idea of this systematic inquiry for the purpose of taking action and enacting positive change, this idea of liberation through knowledge. So a lot of the values that you will see within critical action research and critical research in general are um, the importance of democratic education being very participatory, not only in your pedagogy, but in your research as well, um, empowering, life enhancing. And critical action research builds on the tenets of critical theory, which in, an offshoot of that is critical race theory. You may be familiar with that. So critical research, including critical action research, assumes that there are power dynamics in our societies, including our schools, that actually reproduce inequality and stratify society. And so critical action research is concerned with revealing those instances, those power imbalances, those inequities in our schools and in our, in our society, and through revealing them and studying them, coming up with solutions to help achieve liberation. Um, and then practical action research is, you can think more about the doing, the pragmatism emphasizes the how-to, the methodological approach, and the practical problem solving um, by teachers who are being um, professionals, who are working um, they are having their own autonomy in identifying the problems or working in teams to address some of those issues um, to really solve problems on this practical sense. Um, so I would love to know in the chat or in perusal, uh, where do you find yourself falling more so, more so in the critical, more so in the practical or an element of both and why? Um, so in the chapter towards the middle to the end, Mills starts to make an argument for why. Why should teachers engage in action research? Um, so of course, to improve teaching practices, professional growth. Um, so when educators engage in this action research cycle, they are improving their effectiveness. Um, and learning more. And it's kind of this self-directed way to grow as a professional. Um, I also really like this concept of positioning ourselves as having a growth mindset. I think that that's very aligned with a lot of the pedagogical approaches many of us take in our classroom. Of course, hopefully, uh, action research has the power and potential to enhance student outcomes, whether it be through um, more inclusive classrooms, stronger relationships, um, better teaching, um, or even you know stronger test scores for students. There's a lot of possible potential um, positive student outcomes. 
Um, and then the last two are some of my favorite. So thinking about action research as a way to really professionalize teaching. So this is something that is very, um, a very important topic in the educational scholarship and in our profession in general is teachers really, um, being treated as and rising to the status of a profession. And so in, um, I, I don't know if it was in this text or another text, but so I mentioned that the medical field also, um, like nursing particularly engages in action research. So by positioning teachers as these autonomous professional um, practitioners who are engaging in their own problem solving is really a way to increase how we feel about the profession in general. And um, I think that it even has implications for teacher retention and for growth when we are situated, and I'm speaking from a teacher myself, when we're feeling this um, locus of control in terms of being trusted to identify the problems and engage in the inquiry and come up with the solutions through that ourselves. So it can be very professionalizing, the professional disposition. Um, and then the critical examination. So this is different from the critical theory perspective. This more has to do with taking a reflective stance. And there is so much research about the power of reflection for teachers. So when teachers reflect on their teaching practice, they do better. And so action research is a way to take on this reflective stance. So being more reflective about what's happening in your classroom and your practices and the impact on students, and then taking it beyond reflecting on it to a systematic engagement of reflecting on your practices and then collecting data to understand the impact of it, and then analyzing it and then making decisions based on that process. So making informed decisions, having this reflective stance, um, linking your prior knowledge to new information, learning from your experience, asking questions, and systematically finding answers to them. So I see these two as, well, really they are all connected, but these bottom two especially. Um, and um, Mills also does a little bit about justifying why action research as well, um, talking about how action research is a, a valid form of research and scholarship and knowledge production um, and how it can be incredibly empowering because it's extremely relevant for educators because it is created for them and by them. Um, so since they are the one, educators are the one identifying the problems, the findings are directly applicable to their work. So this, um, in thinking about this section, Mills is kind of talking about the disconnect at times between theory and practice and how action research is really bridging that gap. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, I, I noted that I think a lot of teachers really enjoy reading um, educational research as well. So um, I think that perhaps I might have a slightly different take, but um, access to research findings and then um, talking about challenging educational reform, which I think um, I definitely agree with that. Um, educational reform and educational policy is my field. And so there's a lot written about it. However, being in a school really helps me see other issues that you might not see if you are just looking at the theoretical policies. So I think that it is a really great way to, particularly if you're engaging in the collaborative action research, to really make some changes that are powerful on the teacher level, student level, school level, and beyond. Um, so here is just a quick summary of chapter one. So thinking about the research practices, comparing the practices of traditional educational research and action research, how it can be very empowering for educators, and then this cycle of continuous improvement and how that's very professionalizing and a really great practice for educators to engage in. So all throughout the semester, you are going to learn how to do that and you are going to get to actually practice. So. Um, I did want to do a few notes about um, the first chapter 
from the Sager book, uh, What is Action Research? So the Sager book is perhaps more of a condensed version of how to approach action research. So most of the ideas are incredibly similar, but there are some um, elements in the Sager that I think are worth pointing out. So I will do that here. Um, so again, so one, one difference between Sager is, to, is more so an emphasis on how um, action research, collaborative action research amongst colleagues who are engaging in it either side by side or together can really transform a school. So thinking about this culture of continuous improvement, both for individuals or for groups of teachers together. Um, so that, um, and then also Sager, instead of having the four, like we saw in the dielectric spiral, um, per Sager proposes seven steps. Um, so the first one is the same, selecting a focus. And um, so Sager has like kind of some more strategies about how to do that that I'll incorporate in future lectures. But then um, the aspect of this that I find really important, um, and it is incorporated, Mills does incorporate it, it's just not explicitly laid out the way Sager does, is this step of clarifying theories. So after selecting your focus, Sager proposes that teachers should engage in reflecting on their own beliefs. What led them to have, what beliefs are they having about their practice, their classroom, their students, what led to those and how is that impacting the choices that they might be making? So these clarifying theories referring to like your personal theories that you might have about what's happening. And then also separating out research questions. Um, and then everything else is pretty much the same there. So I'll be kind of throughout the semester and the lectures pulling out the relevant differences here that I think that will be interesting for you to know. So after you have read chapter one and after you have read um, your other readings for this week, I want you to go ahead and engage in your own practice and do some reflection. Um, go ahead and take on that reflective stance and think about it. So here are a few different prompts for you to think about to reflect. And I want you to choose one that, or a combination of one, or maybe you're inspired to reflect on something different. Um, so maybe your beliefs and approaches in STEAM teaching, maybe reflecting on how you view action research as a tool for change. Um, teacher collaboration in school culture or methodological considerations in action research. So again, after you've read the chapters and your readings, I want you to reflect on one of these. Now go ahead, don't put it in this section of the perusal. There is a section in the fourth part of the perusal where you have a whole section to re reflect. So you will see a few more detailed questions like this there. And I am looking forward to seeing your thoughts.